Okay, we are back here with our first guest of the day, Bill Harrison, Senior Product Manager over at AWS Elemental. Bill, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, so uh, we've alluded to it. It's off in the title, uh, but the subject of today's discussion here is AWS Elemental Media Tailor Channel Assembly. So I know a bit about this feature from when we spoke last, but I think it'd probably be better to, to start with the problem that it's solving. Uh, the media services certainly solve yep. a, a large set of the problems. Why don't you walk me through the user journey? Someone that might start to get uh, excited about this before they even know what it does. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, fundamentally, um, when you talk about uh, live video, there's two types of live video. There's video that's actually live, which is what we're doing right now. I mean, we are literally talking right now and people are seeing us talk. It's live. And then there's linear TV that's comprised of, you know, a lot of the time static file-based content, like an episode of a TV show or a movie or, or, or something like that. And the overwhelming amount of content is file-based. So you're watching a channel and most of the time it's going to be content that's pre-canned, pre-recorded. The problem is that uh, almost every single live channel you see, it re-encodes those files into live streams, okay? And that's quite expensive computationally because you have to decode a bitstream, re-encode it, send it out down, down the wire, but it's the only way things could work um, until we moved into this OTT world where things are delivered um, over the top. So what channel assembly brings is the ability to take existing packaged VOD clips. So like, let's say it's an episode of a TV show that you already publish as a VOD and simply reproject it out as a live stream without having to re-encode. So it takes existing sources that may already exist and manipulate the playlist to make it look like it's a live stream. And the benefit of that is that it is incredibly low cost. I mean, it's just text file manipulation versus video um, encoding as, as I'm sure you guys are aware, video encoding is pretty full on on, on the CPU. Uh, and the, the other side effect is that the quality is persistent throughout the stream. So if you've spent, you know, five hours in, in encoding your, your VOD, all that effort you put into compressing it down to the lowest possible bits with the highest possible quality, that goes all the way through into live stream because you don't have to re-encode in, in real time. Um, I'll just make one more quick point um, around the uh, media tailor side of things. So media tailor is what's called an SSAI platform. So it will take um, ads and put uh, dynamic ads in per viewer. So if we're watching the same stream, we'll get different ads tailored to us, right? That technology is very similar to what channel assembly was. So that's why they've sort of been merged in, into the same, same thing. So Media Tailor already does taking files, which are commercials and puts them into a live stream. Channel assembly takes just anything, you know, and, and, and any file-based source and converts that into a live stream without needing to re-encode. This is fascinating. So uh, what I'm hearing here is, is essentially that we have Media Tailor, and again, forgive me if naive impression here, sort of Swiss Army knife for being able to assemble broadcasts. It has a, a large number of feature sets. Yeah. And what we're particularly talking about here with the launch in channel assembly is the ability to really easily yeah. and in a performant and, and, and a preserve high fidelity and quality string together VODs, almost like a playlist, and put that and, and basically display that without having to re encode as a live stream. Um, is that, did I get all of that right? 100% correct. Yes, that's exactly correct. Except you managed to do it without the diatribe that I <laughs> that I did. But no, that, that's a very accurate summary. No, for, for folks that are... Uh, no, actually, a, no. Go ahead. Okay. One question I had was, you know, what, what sure. is the big deal about re-encoding? Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Why, why is the re-encoding a big deal? And why is it really nice to avoid that? Yeah, I mean, people on this uh, on on this stream have probably encoded video before, so you've seen how computationally intense it is, right? If 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 you take a one hour clip of a of a movie that you've filmed yourself and try and export it out of Premiere Pro or something like that, you know, it can take six hours to export one hour of video. So encoding is is really computationally intense. To then do it in real time. You either need to uh, beef up the uh, encoding machine, right? And, you know, so there is Media Live does exactly this, 
right? But it's 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 a high energy usage. It uses a lot of computation in 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 order to create a, a new bit stream because it has to decompress and recompress the, the video in real time. So as quickly as the video stream is coming in, it needs to output the the, the same um, video stream as well. And that, that that also introduces issues to do with latency. So if you're reading a file, re-encoding it, delivering it, then you're basically introducing latency in, in the mix. But with something like channel assembly, because we're manipulating only the playlist, we can move the playlist wherever we want. So we can make sure that everybody's watching the same thing at the same time with a very long forward buffer because we know what the future is. We know that the rest of this episode is, is, is going to be broadcast because it's the whole episode is already there. And so you can get into a situation where you have a live stream with a forward buffer, as in a buffer of content that's going to be played that you're downloading, that's about five minutes or 10 minutes into the future, rather than the usual five to 10 seconds. Um, and so it's high quality, lower cost, easy to manage, all of those great things. So if I understand correctly, what, well, actually, I'm not even going to try. I think I'm pretty sure I'm <laughs> wrong, but what was, what was the, you know, you described a whole bunch of different problems. What, how yes. were customers solving these problems before this integrated feature set came along? Yeah, so the way you would traditionally do uh, like a live uh, TV channel online was you would take uh, either an existing broadcast feed, so something that's going out over cable or terrestrial, something like that, and simply pass it through a live encoder to create multi-bitrate video and send that through a CDN and people watch it, right? That's more or less how it happened, okay? Or if you didn't have a broadcast stream and you just wanted to do a pure OTT stream, you would queue up a whole bunch of files and just push those files into a live encoder. And, you know, file one into live encoder, file two. But that live encoder always needs to run. Similar to, for example, OBS or, you know, whatever we're using right now to, to do this broadcast. Um, but that had with it cost and fragility and you had to basically manage all of that just by, by reducing the number of channels you ran. You might only run three or four or five because the cost per channel gets, you know, incrementally higher. But with uh, Channel Assembly, you can look up the pricing right now. It's 10 cents in the US regions, 10 cents per hour that a channel is running. So if you ran a channel for 24 by 7, that's $73 a month, right? So $73 a month gets your channel that's running 24 by 7. Contrast that to many thousands of dollars to run a, a live channel through the encoding method. So the, the cost per channel, very low. And that allows uh, broadcasters and, and other customers to create really nuanced kind of um, segmented um, uh, channels. So you can have like a fishing channel and a sporting channel and a channel of just highlight clips because the incremental cost per channel is, is so low. And that hopefully drives engagement because users like to watch TV channels rather than, than VOD on average. In fact, I've actually got a funny story. What, one of our first sort of launch customers um, they created a movies channel. So it's basically just the, the exact same movies you can get by going through the menu and watching a movie and just creating a stream of movies, right? That stream saw more usage than the entire VOD side of, of, of the stream because, because people don't really know what they want to watch. They, they, they know they want to watch comedy. So they're like, oh, there's a comedy channel now. Let's just watch the movie halfway through. I personally don't do that. I like to find a movie and watch it from the beginning, but I'm apparently quite unusual because a lot, you know, m most people like, like, like to um, uh, be in there, uh, just jump into a stream and, and carry from that point forward. I, I think you have a really good point. I hadn't really thought about it until you put it that way, but I have accidentally watched or unintentionally watched Lord of the Rings way too many times. Yeah. So I never that, <laughs> Just because it's that, on. That's that's exactly right. And another component to that that's actually quite um, important, at least to most of our customers, is the ability to insert ads. And this is where Media Tailor obviously works very harmoniously because you can insert the ads really easily. So Channel Assembly allows you to insert the ad breaks and there'll be like, you know, a break in the content where it'll be like a 15 second ad break. And then Media Tailor will go off to an ad server and insert the ads that, that are relevant to, to that viewer there. So you can monetize a channel with a cost basis of $73 a month. And as long as you have a few viewers coming back and watching that channel, it's self, self funding, right? So you can create, you can create enough revenues to substantiate that channel, including operational overhead, and hopefully drive qu quite a bit of profit as well. So that's a really, that's a really interesting synergy. Uh, essentially, if channel assembly helps you make this playlist, like, 
whenever I think of this, I just think of the TV Guide channel. Like that's that's all I think of. It's like each totally. row is a different channel, and then all of the different shows or episodes that are on there sequentially are essentially queued up on demand content. You know, and and obviously if it was a live news yeah. network, it would just give you some placeholder that says what they're going to talk about, and that's a little different. But um, yeah, now essentially imagine if the ads were invisible on there on the, on the TV Guide and, and Channel Assembly helps you just string those along exactly where you want. So it sort of solves two major problems, insertion of ads, but then also stringing together on-demand content. So uh, some really yes, cool- Yes, at yeah. a cheap, easy cost. That, that, that's, I mean, it, all, all of this stuff was possible previously, but you needed to have sort of a broadcast background. You know, you needed to understand what Scuddy 35 signaling was and how to insert the correct timing information. Very, very broadcast heavy stuff, right? But this this moves it in, in, into the world of developers. So you can just use, you know, a simple RESTful API. You can use the AWS console. I can, you know, share that as well if you like. Um, and it, it takes it out of the, the need to be a video expert into the world of just using the console and understanding, you know, basic concepts to do with, you know, I want this thing to follow this thing to follow this thing. Yeah, we'll get into the the usage in, in, in a moment here when you, when you show us the demo, but... Uh, you know, you were hinting on sort of traditional broadcast uh, setups and, you know, we had sort of this twofold. We had the the showing of on-demand content and you yeah. had something like this, truly live. Um, and, and you know, you touched on some of the yes. things that we're actually using to power this stream right now. I'm streaming from a, a version of OBS, Open Broadcaster Software, and I'm, I'm essentially in real time with, again, not a laptop, a beefy desktop with a GPU and a powerful processor. I'm encoding in real time the video call that we're having and overlaying some graphics and frame by frame, essentially, that is being pushed in real time with no forward buffer because we're, we're, we chose low latency, we're streaming on Twitch, streaming on LinkedIn, no delay. And all of that high quality, uh, you know, like uh, minimal compression or just as much as this is necessary without being uh, reducing quality um, and not dropping any frames. So, uh, you know, all of that comes at a cost. And, and the reality is that not everybody has access to that hardware. And furthermore, why pay for that type of hardware if you really don't need to, right? Why re-encode something that has exactly. already been encoded, right? Uh, I know I've heard quotes from uh, digital media companies that do encoding and you hear like how long it takes for like, 10 frames or, or three seconds of footage yeah. and, and you just ruin all of that by re-encoding over it when you're pushing it over o over live if it's already on demand like why waste the money and i think the reality is that a lot of folks probably just didn't have alternative options or, or they weren't accessible enough to them without a bunch of broadcaster experience you know like i, I stream all of the yes. time i manage the broadcast for the show and even then a lot of the things you're talking to are still completely over my head right so um, truly a small number of folks, I would say, that probably had the expertise to do this, but Channel Assembly now bringing that to a wider audience. You said developers, but also anyone that could probably walk through the console, it sounds like. Exactly, 100% correct. Awesome. So, I, uh, I yeah, kind of want to see a demo. This seems, this seems amazing. I, I, I feel like, uh, Nick, are we ready to move on to the demo here? Yeah, yeah, we could. And then, you know, we can we can talk to sort of like, Again, in summary, uh, but I'm excited to just see this in action. So, Phil, if you want to show us anything, that would be that would be super exciting. Yeah, totally. So I've just started a screen share. Um, I believe that is working. You'll have to let me know if it's if it's not. Um, so what you see here is the AWS console. Probably nothing too um, shocking to anybody. Uh, and it's underneath the media tailor. So if you go under services, you'll find it under media tailor. Okay, and you'll notice that there's a new section here called channel assembly, and this is where you configure, you know, channels. The first step would be to configure a source location. This is the host. This is where your sources live. And in this case, I've defined it to be CloudFront because CloudFront is the CDN. It's where channel assembly can get the sources from. It's where consumers can download the sources, um, and it, it, it works as both a delivery mechanism and a sourcing mechanism for for channel assembly. And then within the, um, this test origin that I've just created here, I've got a few uh, sources. I've got an episode of Motel in the Jungle. I've got an episode of Goliath. These are both fantastic uh, shows in case anyone's interested. And um, I've got another source here called an ad break slate. And that ad break slate, as you can imagine, is sort of the slate that I use to insert as ads. So I've got these three things. Now I'm going to create a, I'm, sorry, I'm question? Jump in. Yeah, I'm going to jump in really quickly. So yeah, you say absolutely. you have these on-demand episodes. Uh, some of these things are familiar, familiar to me here, but 
these are essentially just either what objects in S3 or I, I see an ARN for, for media tailor. Like what is the, what, yes. what is the lead up to how we got these assets and in what state are they in basically? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. So there would be um, a lot of work that goes into preparing these assets in the first place. And I'm sort of assuming that that work has already been done in a VOD context, because if you look here, we've got in this uh, source, we've got a path to an index on M308, which is a HLS stream, and a path to an index on MPD, which is a dash stream. So we've got this source, Mertan the Jungle, packaged as HLS and packaged as Dash. And if we wanted more, we can just add basically as, as many as you want. So if you had something with DRM or something with closed captions or, you know, however the content is packaged already, Channel Assembly will work with that. Uh, so if I just go back now, um, I might just jump to the, to the channels page, which is where you'd actually configure a channel. And I've just here created a, another channel, you know, test channel um, with those uh, sources loaded. Okay, so um, what I have here in front of me is a schedule, and this is a, effectively what is happening on this channel. So because I've only got two real sources of one commercial, I've created one source, uh, sorry, I've created one program called first, another program called second. The first program refers to Goliath and the second program refers to Mozart in the Jungle, okay? And if I go into one of these programs, I've also defined two ad breaks. I've defined an ad break at the beginning of the program. So it's sort of like a pre-roll before the show starts. And another ad break, 60,000 milliseconds, which is 60 uh, seconds or one minute into the show. So there'll be another mid-roll break one minute into the show. I, okay. I, I really um, and like then you'll that. also... Yeah. All right, I know I'm interrupting, but I like that it's in milliseconds. You can really get the exact moment to give your audience the optimal cliffhanger before the, the yeah. ad rolls to, to bring it back. <laughs> Yeah, and that, that, that's a good point. So a, a lot of content is edited to sort of fade to black right when the ad uh, starts. And, you know, when it comes back, it almost replays the last few seconds of the last thing. So if you encode your sources right and you put a segment boundary right at the right point, then you, yes, you can insert the ad to be near enough, the same as broadcast, but very, very accurate um, at, at insertion capability there. But you'll see here that this is now looping in perpetuity, right? Because... We just want this channel to loop. We've only got two things, but if I wanted to, I could add more programs to this loop. I won't go through that workflow now, but you, if you wanted to, you could add a third and then reference a, a third source. And then when the loop loops again, you know that, that will be updated on, on, on the next iteration of the loop and this um, schedule will update itself. Now, I've also got the um, setting here to basically enable the channel, which you know starts the channel. You're only build once the channel is running. So if I stop this channel, It'll take about a few minutes and then, you know, there'll be four or fours on, on, on this channel. But you could, in theory, do all of the pre-work, get everything constructed, everything working, it'll cost you zero. Traditional sort of broadcast infrastructure, the upfront cost is significant. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars just to get started. Here, you could have the channel scheduled, content prepared, everything ready to go, cost you zero. You hit start. You can run it for five, six, seven, eight hours. Hit stop. You've only paid for the amount of time that it's running. So the, you know, risk to to start and try is is very very low. Um, and on the output side, um, you can see here these are the outputs from the channel. So we have the the sort of corresponding HLS stream and the corresponding DAS stream, and this this exists uh, at at the source level as well. So it corresponds to that. Finally. We can also take this URL, which is the output from channel assembly, and use it as the input to the media tailor SSAI profile. So under this profile, you can see here, I've taken in the video content source, which is the channel assembly output, and basically wrapped an SSAI profile over the top, and then integrated with a dummy ad server that responds with random ads. So if I was to share the stream URL to people, each individual viewer would get their own set of ads that corresponds to what the ad server told us to do. Um, and I can even show you the stream. Uh, I don't know how good this is going to look on, <laughs> on a screen share, but um, this, so we're in an ad at the moment. Um, when, we, when we go back to the content, and by the way, this looks incredibly high quality on my screen. It probably doesn't look too great for everybody else, but because it's, it's reusing the VOD encode. So this is just an episode of the content. Oh, sorry, I paused it there. Um, 
uh, and you can see here it's playing as, as a live broadcast. So people are watching this in real time as if it was live television, although it is very much a file, okay? And you can see here that this feels like completely live television to me and an ad break will happen after a minute and you know then it'll transition to the next show a minute um, after that. So I could probably even put the uh, link into the chat if people wanna uh, be so bold as to attempt it themselves. Um, but I might need to just get some help with that because I'm not on the Twitch uh, links right now. Yeah, if you just uh, send that over Slack to one of us, maybe we'll be able to get that in. But yes, while you're sending that over, I'm going to try and recap everything that I heard because there's some like major talking points around the value here that I don't, we haven't even covered yet, right? Like I talked before about it, it can be inaccessible to buy a bunch of hardware or to use that for broadcasting. But more than anything, this is one of the foundational cloud computing financial principles, right? Move away from upfront CapEx costs into an ongoing on-demand pay-as-you-go OpEx sort of model. And so, um, that cool. Rob, if you don't mind grabbing that and throwing that in chat. And, and so, yeah, like you completely now remove this substantial barrier to entry that it would otherwise be spent, you know, thousands of dollars on hardware, or on encoders, or uh, even just on the training to be able to do all of this. And now you can, with a yeah. handful of on demand video assets, just some files. I'm sure there's some basic walkthroughs there for packaging it because you mentioned that previously. And there you is, can yes. Assemble programs and have your own channels that are billed at an hourly rate. I know you gave us the, you know, if you were to keep it on in perpetuity, something on the order of like $70 a month, but uh, basically a no Correct. startup cost and, and only bill for, for what you're broadcasting on. Um, like that alone is such a game changer, in my opinion, because this, this now enables a whole host of, of individuals, hobbyists, um, you know, organizations and like, let's say conferences, anyone that has on-demand video assets, companies, customers, to now start running these channels and the upfront, the, the cost is so low and you can monetize it. Like, to me, this sounds like a bit of a tectonic shift in what people are able to do now. And, and again, I stream a lot and even this is something I would have never dreamed of doing, like running my computer to encode all day on content I already had, no way. But now I have a lot of ideas about how I can reuse content. Hey, we could even make an AWS What's Next channel that just loops across all of our old on-demand content. Uh, I don't know if we'd get approval to run it here. Oh, totally, yeah. But that's the gears are turning because it sounds like there's a lot of different ways to be able to use this. Yes, uh, that, that is 100% correct. The, the other side of that is that a lot of um, broadcast customers or just OTT providers in general already have VOD contents. They already output VOD streams, like a HLS stream, for example. And so the ability to reuse that in a live stream is almost a no-brainer because you know the incremental cost to reuse it is, is, is only $73 a month, you know, rather than having to, to pump it through and, and encode it. So even if you don't already have the um the HLS formatted uh, streams. You can use things like Media Convert to prepare it just as easily as, as you use um, as you use Channel Assembly. So there is a way for almost everybody to at least get started and, and have a go. And to that point, I have actually put another link in the chat. Uh, sorry, the our internal chat. So somebody probably has to publish it to, to Twitch. Um, and that is the link to the workshop, right? And so this workshop is really much a follow the bouncing ball style guide. And it'll take you from beginning to end to construct a channel just in, in basically the, the same way I did just now using some great test source content such as Big Buck Bunny and <laughs> all the usual um, ones that, that, that we see all over the internet. Um, but yeah, the, 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 but both the cost and the complexity get started are, are very, very low. Yeah, and I, I know yeah, some folks definitely. are trying. So I, I had a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I know some people yeah. are trying to click on that link in chat and probably some people are seeing it download as a file. Um, that M3U8 file oh, is, okay. if you're in Safari, if you're on Mac, Safari will open it natively um, so that you can see the stream. Again, that's that's the, the live outputs of the channel. Uh, otherwise, if you have VLC Media Player, you can actually input that as a network source and it will automatically be polling the channel um, for the, the new content as it um, comes in. But essentially to, you know, this isn't yeah. to say, hey, channel assembly only can work with outputs that are those two. Essentially what you would do is if you're on, it, it, maybe I make my own website, I have some sort of basic media player, I can just consume that upstream. Yeah. And this is probably the developer use case that you were talking to. 
right? Yes, there is another uh, open source project called hls.js. So you can just Google that and there'll be a demo player and you can just load that playlist in, in, into that project uh, as well. But that, that, that's a good point, right? So th this, this is very much at the infrastructure level. If, if you're doing a, a front end, then you would need to work with the front end player application. So on Apple, it's very simple. You know, on Android, there's you know, multiple players on websites, there's media source extensions, and you just write a little JavaScript applet to, to load that as, as a player element. Um, again, this is very develop, developer focused type, type stuff. So if, if you've got any experience making front end applications, you can just take that URL and plug it into many different player frameworks. I feel like uh, all this problem needs is a little JavaScript will be the words on my tombstone someday, but um, <laughs> glad, glad to see that, you know, that's all it yeah. takes to be able to get started with a, with a channel here. I see Rob also linked um, an example app um, Rob, did you want to explain that? I, I'm not as familiar with, uh, I haven't opened it yet. Yeah, well, that, that's just the, uh, the HLSJS project that Phil was just referencing it. So if you go to that URL, the hlsjs.netlify.app slash demo, and you paste in the, uh, the endpoint that Nick pasted earlier, you can see the channel and everything that Phil was just showing you. Now, Phil, one, one thing I've been wondering is, you know, we talked about the, the incredible price difference, you know, this used yeah. to cost tens of thousands of dollars to get a channel set up and to maintain this kind of thing. Uh, and you now you say that, you know, this is now $73 a month. Can you break that down a little bit for us? I think that that's something that a lot of people are, are going to perk up and they go, what do you mean? You're talking about, you know, something, like, uh, you know, a hundred uh, times improvement here. What is actually included here, right? So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it, it's a great point. So there is a, there is a line of thinking that we took uh, where we wanted to keep the pricing construct as uh, easy as possible. So when when you when you construct a channel, you have multiple outputs as you saw. So you have a HLS output, a dash output, and then you can have any number of requesters come and request those streams. So you would have to calculate the way in which that gets used. So that you have, you know, X number of segments to times X number of playlist types times X number of users. And that can get very, you know, quite messy to calculate quite quickly. And that's that's the reason we abstract that from the user and to say it's it, it's a fixed price to use our data plane and our control plane in order to to get the um, the playlists out of it. So straight away, it's very, you know, just using mental arithmetic, you can work out what, what you're going to spend. To answer the question about what does that include? It includes the manifest generation or the origination of the stream. So if you pump that through something like a CDN, then uh, the CDN is obviously going to be um, an in incremental cost on top of it. If you prepare the content using something like uh, Media Convert, then that is also going to be an incremental cost because you, you need to prepare the content. But in a lot of cases, you're reusing something that already exists. So uh, in, in the CDN example, if you have a pool of users, right, and th those pool of users have gone away from watching VODs in a movie channel and have gone to watch uh, a live movies channel, then you've taken away some amount of CDN usage from the movie channel and moved it to the, to the live stream, right? But the upshot is that people watch for longer. So you have the viewers that you had watch for more hours, more ads, you know, better engagement, et cetera. So it's not, a, it's not a, like a incremental doubling it's just an incremental difference between what's taken away and what's what's been um added yeah so just to be super super crisp about this when a yes. viewer tunes in you know whether through this this hls app or through you know some sort of embedded web app or mobile app or yes. what have you the data transfer that they that incurs a separate cost that shows up as a separate line item on your bill and that, that is Standard CDN cost because that's going through the CDN. Is that a, yeah. a fair summary? It's a fair summary. So you bring your own CDN. It just so happens that I configured CloudFront to be the CDN, uh, but there's no reason you could use any other service delivery mechanism. You know, there's other CDNs out there. If you wanted to, you could use it. Um, same goes for the source locations. I just used uh, S3 as an example. You can use your own, you know, packaging system if you wanted to. It's very much, um, you know, bring your own, build it how you want to build it in order to be able to 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 reuse. But yes, that is absolutely true. Any any delivery costs, data egress is 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 a is an egress um, charge as well. Yeah. So again, you know, to just tie this together, just moving again towards paying for value. It, 
a, a lot of this conversation is enlightening in that there's just simply so many different computational network um, and delivery bottlenecks here in terms of, of how infrastructure should be provisioned to be right-sized. And what's clear to me here is that by controlling the manifest and the, the origination, you can pay for only as many channels as you want and how long they're active. And then with the, the costs to delivery, i.e. like CloudFront or whatever your CDN is here, then you're also only building, being billed effectively for people that are consuming that content. So you're really just paring down this, this, the fat and the question of, you know, yeah. what, what is my like infrastructure burden and how do I right size that? And instead you're just entirely thinking, how many channels do I want? How long are they going to be active for? And I'm only going to be billed for the amount of content people are essentially consuming on top of that as a consumption model. Um, and that to me makes it so much easier, especially with, you know, you said, I think it's SS uh, AI, is that server side ad insertion uh, to be able to then monetize yes, it. Correct. And then you, you're working all in unit, like, like unit economics, you have a common denominator and it's, it's, it's how many channels you have and, and how many people are consuming. And then the unit economics, to run an experiment or to even have entire channels just is so much more streamlined. You don't have to compare apples to, the, yeah. you know, uh, like pineapples over on the other side. That's exactly right, Nick. And that, that that's really the intention behind the pricing model is, is to make sure that it, it, it basically is easy to mentally work out what this is going to cost and how much it will cost moving forward. So even if my users go up by this, I have a you know a, a stable way of calculating my costs. Wonderful. Well, that's Phil. awesome. Well, I, I learned so much in, in all this. You know, Nick's actually heard me. You know, we, as Phil, as you can tell, we do this video. We do quite a bit of uh, uh, video processing and, and production. Uh, yeah, I bet. Thankfully, thankfully, mostly Nick, because I asked <laughs> such dumb questions that you'd be surprised. Like, I, I Nick's heard me complain about why we even need a video encoder at all. So the amount of the amount of education I've gotten out of this is already worthwhile. Just even though I'm a co-host here. <laughs> See, I take solace in I appreciate knowing that. Yeah, thank that my my GPU over here. The electricity it costs to run that is offset by the heat it puts off that then offsets my heating bill. So there's, there's a full closed loop here. <laughs> and unfortunately, I, I wish I didn't have to perform those calculations. But uh, something like channel assembly if it, uh, seems to make that a lot easier. And I just have so many ideas for ways to now make use of on-demand content that I have, right? Like you can post it into onto YouTube or other places or you know wherever your on-demand content repository is. But there's just something about the ability to make a live sort of curated channel and then show that in whatever way you want your users again really interesting stats around increased engagement there so i'm going to try and play around with all of that um but i want to be fair to our next guest as well because they're hanging out backstage so again phil harrison senior product manager over on aws elemental talking to us about media taylor's new channel assembly feature launch uh phil thank you again for joining us